Hello and welcome to the first ever episode of Once Upon a Nightmare. I am your host Lorraine and I am here to discuss all the horrors of the world, be it fictional or real. I have enjoyed the world of horror and true crime for well over 30 years now and I'm hoping to come to you all as much as possible. My favourite kind of horror is psychological rather than gore not a big fan of gore for gore's sake i don't mind some of them but when it comes to movies like hostel and saw well i will watch them but i will look away from the screen and on occasion i will block my ears as i wasn't actually allowed to watch horror films when i was a child i would go to the video shop and watch them through the poster or the case of the video and by that i mean I would literally pick up a case and read it and that's how I would do it. I remember a certain film, Zombie Flesh Eaters. I was dying to see it, but I couldn't watch it. So I would just go and look at the case and that's how I watched my horror films when I was younger. Um, They didn't make it into our house at all. I think the most that got in there was maybe The Omen, Jaws, but that's about it. So I don't really know where I got it from. But my favourite film is a horror film. So I thought it only fitting to go with that for my first episode. And that was a film directed by the late Jonathan Demme and released in 1991 and comes from the book of the same name from Thomas Harris. And that is the amazing Silence of the Lambs. You spook easily, Starling? Not yet, sir. He's past the others, the last cell. I'll be watching. You'll do fine. A killer is on the loose. Keeps them alive for three days. Then he shoots them, skins them, and dumps them. A rookie FBI agent is on his trail. He's got real physical strength, cautious, precise, and he's never impulsive. He'll never stop. But in order to track him down, she'll have to match wits. I'll help you catch him, Clary. Believe me, you don't want Hannibal Lecter inside your head. With the darkest of all minds. Just do your job and never forget what he is. But he's a monster. Pure psychopath. So rare to capture one alive. So close to the way you're going to catch him, do you realize that? Oh, Clarice, your problem is you need to get more fun out of life. You told me you don't spook easily. You call this easy, sir? Lecter's missing hand arm. Man's a raving maniac. Who knows what he'll do? Thank you, Clary. Thank you. Silence of the Lambs is an 18. It's a horror thriller and runs for about two hours and 20 minutes. And while it was released in America nationwide on the 14th of February, how romantic, in 1991, it didn't reach Ireland until June 14th 1991 and this was back in the days where films were released in the States and they didn't quite make it over to Ireland or the UK for a few months. I would have been shy, a year shy of seeing that film but I never saw it at the pictures. I didn't see it until it was released on video. The Science of the Lamb stars Anthony Hopkins as Hannibal Lecter, a psychotic serial killer and psychotherapist who also happens to be a cannibal And it also stars Jodie Foster as Agent Starlin. Starlin as a young and -and up-and-coming criminal psychologist with the FBI. She is sent by boss Jack Crawford, who is played by Scott Glenn, to try and extract (laughs) extract information from Lecter, who is under the care of the creepy Dr. Frederick Chilton, played by Anthony Hild at a mental institution. Yeah, I'm more afraid of Chilton than I am of Lecter. He's disgusting. Anyway, Starlin needs information on the latest serial killer, Buffalo Bill, who is played by Ted Levine, who is killing women for the purpose of making a skin suit and is currently holding Catherine Martin, a.k.a. Brooke Smith, in the basement after kidnapping her. When this film was originally set, it did have some big names on it. The leads were going to be Michelle Pfeiffer as Starling, Sean Connery as Lecter, don't know how I feel about that and Gene Hackman as Crawford but they all kind of deemed it too violent and while I do love all these actors I think the ones they went with did work well together it did well at the Oscars winning best picture director best adapted screenplay best actor and best actress and the budget was around 90 million dollars and grossed around 262 million dollars worldwide While this is fiction, there are many true crime elements to it. Lambs can be related to quite a few serial killers, actually. Um, You can see where Harris got his inspiration from. Firstly, there is Gary Heidnick, the piece of shit from Philadelphia. He actually kept women in his basement and he did unspeakable things to them. Egg Gein, 
probably a more well-known one he made items from this victim's skin and then of course the well well-known one Bundy his old technique of pretending he's injured to ask for help and all these serial killers are you know absolutely some of the worst and to be clear why I'm fascinated with serial killers and the whole true crime genre I do also think they are the biggest shower of pieces of shit out there and these traits are all apparent in the character of Buffalo Bill. The Silence of the Lambs was inspired by the real life relationship between criminologist and law enforcement officer Robert Keppel and serial killer Ted Bundy. Bundy actually helped Keppel investigate the Green River serial killers in Washington and uh, oh god I can just imagine Ted Bundy thinking he was the shit helping out in this case. If you've ever seen any footage of him he's such an arrogant prick. Anyway this didn't stop Bundy though from being executed on January 24th and 1989 and the Green River killers weren't actually Actually solved until 2001 and that was uh, Mr. Gary Ridgway and he was then arrested and on November 5th 2003 in a Seattle courtroom he pleaded guilty to 48 counts of aggravated first degree murder so another piece of shit but this wasn't the only connection with some of form of law, law enforcement they were used quite a bit when this was filmed like the real life FBI's behavioral science unit assisted in the making of this film and in an interview with John Douglas, who I love, by the way, check him out in interviews on YouTube. Um, such a fascinating life. Douglas is the writer of Mindhunter and Demi visited the FBI uh, headquarters in Quantico before filming. And uh, uh, Douglas said in an interview that apparently Demi was really shocked because like their offices, if you've seen Mindhunter, they're about 60 feet below ground. It's very grim. And, you know, the fact you know, there was a lot of cooperation in making this film. And Scott Glenn, aka John Crawford, he also got to spend time with uh, uh, John Douglas. And um, But speaking of Glenn, he did go above and beyond for this role. He watched certain tapes that showed the torture and murder of women, stated this as a reason for not reprising uh, his role. And the videos, you know, they haunted Glenn and it's just something he couldn't get out of his mind. And I think, you know, for any of you, especially that are into true crime, sometimes you watch something and you really wish you hadn't. For me, it's I'll never go back to the Moors murders because of one photo I saw um, and I can't get that in my mind. I'm not going to tell you what it is because I don't really want to put it in your mind. But anyway, Foster also spent a great deal of time with FBI agent Marianne Christ prior to filming. Um, Christ gave Foster the idea of standing by her car and crying. If you remember that scene. Krauss told Foster that at times, as you can just imagine, the work must become so overwhelming that it's a good way to kind of get that emotional release and especially on your own, you know, because as you know, the film is a bit of a boys club and you don't want to be crying in front of the men. The production received full cooperation from the FBI as they saw it as a potential way of recruiting more um, female agents. And Clarice Starlin works out of the FBI training headquarters in Quantico, Virginia on a U.S. Marine Corps base about 14 miles southwest of Washington, D.C. When this film was released, as I said, I desperately wanted to see it, but as I mentioned, I didn't until it came out on video. I hadn't read the book, but I, I did find it utterly fascinating. I even went as far, yes, it was the 90s. Remember those coats that came out with FBI? They were navy on the back of it. I got one of them. I was obsessed. And I didn't know the whole story, but knowing Hopkins and Foster were in it, it, you know, it was based around serial killers, was enough to hook me in. And I always had this like dream of joining the FBI back in the 90s. Um, and I heard apparently you have to be American to join it. I don't know if that's true anymore, but apparently back then you did. And, you know, when I saw this poster, it really did intrigue me because it didn't really give much away. And, you know, you look deep into this poster and there's like this demonic moth and um, covering uh, Jodie Foster's mouth with like a skull face and you know I suppose that's the darkness of the moth and the lightness of Starlin you know it could be seen as like a good and evil within the film as Starlin you know she's a, she's a good one that one's a good one the picture is somewhat innocent in a sense I suppose like that of a little lamb and also I think the use of a woman in the picture shows that she is the main protagonist her face if you haven't seen it, it takes up the whole the whole picture and uh, the use of a female would, you know, it would challenge the norm of what we're used to seeing as it's usually a man that we see on these pictures. And throughout the film, we see a female character and the challenges she faces in a role that would be usually saved well for a man. You know, I was surprised myself that Hannibal wasn't on the front of it because let's face it, she is given a lot of shit in this film. And, you know, all that's missing really is like a pat on the head for doing a good job. 
Also, another thing that she kind of goes against is we're used to usually seeing a protagonist that like breaks the rules. They kind of go rogue. But Starlin, she's got control. We first see Starlin as a trainee FBI agent and she's on an assault course. And this opening scene is quite creepy in the sense that um, in the way it's shot with the fog in the forest and the sense that she's being followed. And it shows that she's quite alone. And I feel like she's like that throughout this whole film. And this start, this is the start of how men are shown to look at her like if you notice with the male shots the cameras linger on a close-up of a man looking at starlin it's it's almost like she shouldn't be there or to them she shouldn't be there at this particular time you know in the way you see on a film it just feel like very much of a boys club and from this beginning she's very much treated differently because she's a woman and she's very young she's very petite and attractive you know and on appearance to men she it's like she needs to be minded and you know while this is the case she doesn't really let it affect her she doesn't really take any notes of them she just stands up gets on with it stands tall and you know despite the circumstances just she really doesn't give a fuck also her actions show she's not afraid she's not afraid to get dirty this film has been questions as to whether or not it is an actual horror film but i think if you look at some of the situations that starlin actually gets herself into they are very horror-esque and you know she handles them Firstly, you know, she isn't afraid to go down into the lecture in the dungeon. And that scene was creepy as fuck, man. How long would it have taken for one of those orderlies to make it to her if the patients got out? No, thank you. But when visiting lecture, she holds her own. She goes down into the deep, dark corridor with the world's most insane and manages to keep her composure. You know, she she hides if there is any fur there, she she hides it. And the use of colour in this scene as she enters lecture's domain is it's interesting because the bright red obviously suggests that she is entering the depths of hell and thinking of who is down there and it would be correct in thinking that evil does lurk down there and you know then we have lecter who is like standing to attention as she approaches and you know he's also offended that such an inexperienced you know fbi agent who actually isn't fully an agent at the moment would be sent to him the great hannibal lecter lecter is of course a snob he wants people to know his intelligence what he has achieved what he knows you know he likes to discuss a fine taste in wine and his knowledge of shoes you know saying that though there is a real charge side to him it's almost like he's trying to be naughty in a classroom and shock the teacher he tries to engage in like this weird sexual talk and you know with lecter it's like listening to a teenage boy who's just like felt a boo for the first time this is evident when he's discussing her upbringing, all those tedious, sticky fumblings in the back seat of cars. And then he goes on to discuss her relationship with her boss, Jack, Craw- Jack Crawford, trying to get some form of gossip, asking, does he want her sexually? You know, this is another example of Starlin's maturity and her ability to just brush off ridiculous comments that come her way. You know, she doesn't want to engage and reduces his comments to that of what Miggs would say. He then asks about her mother's cousins. Did the rancher make you perform fellatio? Did he sodomize you? Oh, all very boring. And one thing about Demi, you know, that really bring out these types of scenes is his well-known technique for making you feel uncomfortable with how he shoots things. And this definitely works well in this first scene with Lecter and Starlin, the full face frontal in the center of the screen, basically looking right at you. And he uses, you know, he uses this quite a lot in his films. And I've seen it, obviously, in his other films, such as Philadelphia. And, you know, I do enjoy it, but it weirds me out. And you're forced to really look at the subject. And, of course, you have to be willing to be looked at. You do feel like they're looking at you through the screen. And it works really well in this movie. As when Clarice meets Lecter, she doesn't know what she's going into. Like, she's obviously her stuff, but he obviously wants to be in control of the interaction. And, you know, there he is in all his glory in his lovely jumpsuit although i do like how jodie foster claims that during like this first meeting between lecter and starlin if you remember he mocks her southern accent and that was improvised on the spot and jodie foster looks horrified at this reaction and you know she's genuinely horrified and she felt personally attacked but later on she actually goes on to thank hopkins for generating such an honest reaction there's actually also another scene where this really pops up it's when he meets Catherine martin's mother she's the u.s senator ruth martin 
he also get, he gets really childish again in the scene like and you can see that he's enjoying the attention like most serial killers if you watch them in interviews they lap it up you know he gives her some information but while Lecter believes he is more sophisticated than his fellow inmates this this kind of behavior just shows him to be more like them than he thinks he he just conveys it in a more sophisticated tone you know his antics don't stop with Starlin when he resorts to schoolboy you know behavior and then he tries to shock the US center did you breastfeed her and of course she wants to give as much information as she possibly can so she thinks that this is part of the actual way of finding out how to get her daughter back so she's like yes I did and he he turns around and just goes toughened your nipples didn't it like you know but having said that (laughs) I do love with Lecter how unbelievably polite he is at the same time like when Miggs lets loose in that lovely scene all over Starlin like um Lecter is disgusted and he also speaks with a soothing tone and he's extremely intelligent but at the end of the day he's a psychopath and belongs where he is no matter what um another scene that comes up is when Starlin goes to the funeral home because they've discovered a dead girl and she's left in the room with this bunch of officers and they make it really clear that she is not meant to be there mainly due to the nature of the crime you know because you know Crawford is kind of pulled aside to have a word with and not like not in front of the lady not in front of the lady don't want to be upsetting the lady and um you know but she she does she's not having it she she doesn't take this and she pulls Crawford aside and she says it to him but again with such restraint she doesn't have a meltdown then when they are away from the situation when they are on their own she has a word and it's all very calm And, you know, she's just professional at all times. Unlike these bloody officers who make it very clear that they're not happy about her being there. You know, it's all very childish. You know, when she asks the officers to leave, you know, again, they get there there in a huff. They comply, but they just seem so shocked that a young woman is telling them to leave. You you tend to see this in cop films. You know, you have to admit there is a lot of dick measuring that goes on in certain films. But this isn't what Starlin is about. It's more about their ego being her as some woman telling them to leave. And their disdain for her is so evident. They can't hide at all how this is not how things are supposed to be done. And how dare she tell them to leave. But... Crawford though he I think throughout the thing he does appear to be the most decent man in the film as his intentions don't you know he doesn't appear to be like he's trying to basically get her into bed or look down on her unlike creepy Dr Chilton you know his male gaze is not one of leering but you know he wants to teach her and you know he does slip into sexism but he takes the telling off from her and that's what I like about him he may make mistakes but he's he's willing to listen when he's being told and he doesn't seem to mind being corrected by a woman you know and it matters how he acts and how others look at him because obviously if he acts a certain way then others may follow suit but you know also with Starlin she's also the brave one on this she puts her neck out firstly when she follows up on Lee doesn't she let's uh let's not forget the old storage unit it's dark and wet and the door doesn't open properly and that lazy prick is sat in the car and won't come and help and she finds a head in a glass jar but she just gets on with it and and then what we can't forget her first encounter with mr jim gum and uh who is of course buffalo bill he is terrifying he is terrifying and how he first manages to get the woman in the car in his ted bundy-esque way again shows his talent for manipulation he preys on the heartstrings of good people and when Catherine is taken it's because she's doing a good deed so she's she's a nice person now would i have gone back into the would i have gone into the back of that van no to get into the mind of a serial killer though ted levine certainly did his research he read plenty of profiles which like glenn he found truly disturbing and being a true crime enthusiast myself again i do understand what they mean but i guess it's one of those things with me that i just can't help myself and i have to keep going back for more and although there are some i struggle with especially when it comes to kids um but Levine you know he also wanted to get because his his character is a cross-dresser as well so he he also wanted to get an understanding of that so he went to a few trans bars and talked to some patrons and he did a really good job in this role and he was really convincing and you know that one scene with the dance it wasn't actually included in the original screenplay and um but it, it was in the novel I hear but it was added at the insistence of Levine, who thought it was a scene was essential in a way of defining his character, which I thought was really good. It was the one to the song Goodbye Horses. 
um, which is from a 1988 band, K. Lazarus. But I, I think that really helped show what he was trying to do. Um, he's not an overly angry character. I mean, he does shout a bit, but when it comes... But he just comes across as extremely odd and a bit out there, you know. And when he speaks to Catherine, he's being calm. But I suppose it's because he doesn't really want to... He doesn't really see her as anything other than, like, material for his skin suit. It rubs the lotion on the body. It puts the lotion in the basket. He really distances himself from the fact that she's a person, calling her it rather than Catherine. And, you know, when she begs for her life, you know, he then gets mad. But I think it's also... It's almost because when she you know, when she's pleading, he can't ignore her because then she's real. And when the mother is pleading for her to be released, she keeps saying her name over and over and over again to try and make him see as a person that like, that's what they say. It's, it's easier, you know, it's not as easy to cut her up if she's seen as somebody. So keep saying her name might bring that out. And, you know, the only real emotion that we do see of anger towards her uh, towards her is over his dog precious serial killers you know usually they're into animal cruelty so this is a bit out of the norm for a killer also with buffalo bill which i find really terrifying is his lair i noticed because i lived in america for a bit that what's with the bloody basements i fucking hate basements they're terrifying and they're in like all these apartment blocks and it's always where you have to go down to do the bloody laundry as well and um you know it also makes easier to hide people and do all sorts like look at Gary Hynek but you know this I suppose really plays into you know the fears as it's so hidden away and no one of course can hear you scream and his place bloody hell that was so underground I I don't know do basements actually go down that far and have that much space it was also almost like a house under a house you know and I suppose that's something as well that Demi really pulls on in this film is space You know, there are many times when you could feel trapped. Even watching this, there is a lot of scenes that show a lack of space. Firstly, obviously, there is the cells in which Lecter is kept and the area around it. The mask on his face, you know, that contraption he has to wear when he goes to see the centre. And even when Starlin visits the museum. Do you remember that scene with the museum when she's looking into the moths and everything's so close up and how the characters are positioned you know, the close up of the camera, it's so uncomfortable. I felt really uncomfortable there. And it's not a pleasant space, but in true Starlin way, you know, Starlin way, she handles it like a pro. And then we also have the behavior towards Starlin. You know, as she continues to go into the funeral home, there's not much space there. When she's in that elevator, you know, and even when she's pulling up Crawford on what he did, it's in the back of the car, but she's pressed up right against the back seat. She doesn't need to be. Do you know what I mean? So, you know, it's really like no personal space. Um, I suppose, though, most most of it all does come down to Buffalo Bill's lair. The well in which Catherine is kept is by far the most terrifying space. There's very little of it. And your chances of actually getting out of it is um, it, it's not going to happen. And like you see all those nails, don't you? I think you see bits of nails, obviously, where people have tried. And there's also no privacy. You know, he leers over to speak to her. But, you know, finally, which also shows shows another side of Starlin's badassness is when she goes to Bill's home and finally becomes aware that he is Buffalo Bill. And again, she doesn't shy away from it. She goes deep into his home again in someone else's space that she knows nothing about. But Starlin in this matter is also invaded. Not only is she down in the dark area, but she's also thrown into this like complete darkness as the viewer sees like Bill looming over her. Do you remember he's got like those night vision goggles on? He's like reaching out to touch her and she's completely unaware. Again, violation of space, but he he is no match for her as she manages to fire in the direction of Bill and actually killing him. And that's what this film is basically one of your worst nightmares. It is quite, you know, everything is just so dull in its setting. Everything is dark and wet and throw in a creepy as fuck basement and a mental institution, you know, and Ah, but you know so (laughs) i think i've gone on enough and to leave on that note on that lovely depressing scene although this will cheer you up the dog does survive so it's not all bad so to round up this movie as i've said it never disappoints i've watched it multiple times every year and i love it and while starlin spends most of her time being looked at like some small weak woman and given very little respect she is actually the strongest like we never see her hysterical she just gets on with it and even when met with certain roadblocks with her male colleagues you know she just still keeps her cool and makes her point without raising a voice she isn't afraid to speak up and she's beyond professional and in the end 
it's her who actually catches him. So Starlin is a character to be admired and one who many could learn from. And on that note, I hope you enjoyed this first episode. And I would like to say thank you for listening. And don't forget to rate and review on iTunes. And if you have any feedback, be nice. <laughs> um, so I'm a big girl, I can take it. And if you want to find me, you can find me on Instagram as Once Upon a Nightmare Podcast. You can find me on Twitter as a nightmare pod and you can email me at once upon a nightmare pod at gmail.com and i will chat to you very soon with my second episode bye bye